Okay. Good so afternoon, everyone. Well. Thank you very much for joining us on this uh, first uh, event of uh, the new series of uh, Her Story, uh, the story of uh, women that um, can be a very uh, good uh, role model for everyone, for all of us, uh, but also um, they can, they have had their ways of growing and uh, challenges and uh, overcoming challenges. So uh, for today, uh, our first guest is a Lebanese lady, uh, Miss, uh, Mrs. Kolud Vatar Kassem. She uh, lives uh, not in Lebanon right now, but in Dubai. Uh, she's a professor at the university but also she has had a very long political and social life, which uh, she's going to explain to us. Uh, she has been a very good friend of ours, uh, for Women's Federation, Middle East, and also uh, Europe. And um, we have uh, um, seen and in Lebanon as well. Uh, we have seen um, her um, presentations and uh, different activities of hers, and we uh, appreciate her very, very much. So I will give her the floor now uh, to speak to us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zoe. Um, I would like first to uh, thank the Women Federation for World Peace uh, Europe and Middle East uh, to give me the opportunity to kick off this program with a story from the Middle East, from Lebanon, and to share with you my personal life journey. My story is unique. I believe every person is unique, but it is unique in the sense that we cannot be considering it as a typical experience of a Lebanese girl. You see, the diversity and the complexity of Lebanese society makes it difficult to generalize about the experiences of the Lebanese people. Imagine living in a society where your religious beliefs and cultural background are constantly questioned and judged. And this is happening to every Lebanese person in the country. This was my reality growing up as a Muslim girl in a Christian neighborhood in Lebanon. But instead of succumbing to societal pressure, I chose to fight for justice, for love, for peace, not only in Lebanon, but also for humanity at large. Today, I want to share with you my journey of overcoming obstacles and becoming the strong, independent woman I believe I am now. And I love, in fact, what I am now. I've always felt like I was born to challenge the status quo. In fact, I slid, my mom, I slid down my mom's tummy without anybody's help, not even my mom. I was the girl who came to the family after four boys. My arrival was in fact a surprise to my parents. My father was shocked and stated that he didn't want girls in the family, but I was a reality he had to deal with. So I was enrolled in a girls' school and wasn't allowed to leave the house, not even with the company of the seven brothers. Despite these challenges, I always dreamed of changing my life and the lives of the people around me. After high school, I was one of the few accepted students to the American University of Beirut with a scholarship to study nursing. However, my father denied me this opportunity because he believed it was not proper for me as a girl to be in a mixed environment with boys, I mean. I had to pretend suicidal for three months before he finally allowed me to attend to the university. Every time he comes into the house, I would just pretend that I am, uh, um, you know, dying or like fading away. I knew that attending the university was a huge opportunity for me and I wasn't going to let anyone stand in my way. I don't really have prejudice on any member of my family, not even my father, for trying to navigate my life. For back then, it was social norms and values that imprisoned us. 
I believe I was so powerful from inside that I didn't see their stumbling blocks. I used my patience and determination as tools to overcome these obstacles. I focused on my priorities, which were to pursue my education and become a nurse then during the civil war in Lebanon, because I wanted to serve. I put in extra effort to excel in my classes and prove my worth. In addition to facing societal pressure and discrimination, I also had to overcome personal struggles in my life. One of the biggest challenges I faced was when I was told that I had a massive tumor stretching from my neck all the way to my face and that I, was only, I only had a few months to live. Despite this devastating news, I took it lightly and I believed that I would live long enough to bring the change that I look, I'm looking for to the world. I was so discreet about my illness that I didn't even tell my mother. While waiting for my parents to visit my brother in the US, I underwent a serious operation that lasted nine hours. Fortunately, I emerged from it alive and even stronger. During the operation, I met my future husband who was the anesthesiologist administering my anesthesia. It was love at first sight for both of us and we knew we were meant to be together. We've been together since 1987, very long. However, our relationship wasn't without its own struggles. In the beginning, my husband was very jealous and locked me in the house for a few years. I complained to my father, but he told me that this man was the one whom I chose and that I had to fix my own problems. I initially believed that my husband loved me and I realized that it was more of a feeling of ownership than a true partnership, this marriage. It took me about 15 years to gain his trust and become an independent woman with bigger aspirations, including working towards peace in my country and the world. Now, I'm determined to make a difference and nothing can stand in my way. So my question, how did I, how could I take it, you know, 15 years to, to, to achieve my goals? My answer is that I'm grateful to God for the many gifts he has given me, including patience and the ability to prioritize. My top priority has always been and will always be my family. God blessed me with three wonderful boys. And during those 15 challenging yet beautiful years, I focused on raising and taking care of them. I did not have any help from any parents or brothers as they had immigrated to the US and the Gulf region due to the unstable political situation in the country. My journey to liberation began when I worked as a classroom teacher at the American Community School. I had a dream as, uh, as Martin Luther King say it. His dream was of liberation from discrimination and justice. But my dream, I dreamt that my, my husband is cheating on me <laughs> and bringing his girlfriend to make me her servant. I woke up so terrified about my future and decided that I would never be the same submissive girl again. Truly, this dream changed my life. It gave me, it empowered me so, so much that I was determined to bring change to my life and to my family. I would not allow my life to revolve around one person, no matter who that person was. I started to serve in the community. In, 2000, in the year 2000, I was introduced to society, to the society by the late Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri and served for eight years, supporting functional NGOs all over Lebanon without discrimination, trying to build bridges between conflicting parties and sending messages of peace. In 2005, the Prime Minister was assassinated and fear of war spread throughout the country. The Phoenicia Intercontinental Hotel, where I used to hold my fundraising events, was badly affected by the bomb that killed Mr. Harir and his friends. After 40 days, the hotel was rebuilt and I invited more than 500 Lebanese people from all walks of life 
and different religious backgrounds to an event and I called it Women in Peace. There were politicians and all the Lebanese media covered the event. My speech was about the fact that women are the direct victims of war. As mothers, sisters, daughters, friends, neighbors, workers, social servants, we had to join, you know, I was, I was asking them that we have to join efforts to stop any possibility for war creeping into our lives again, as we have had enough. I have lived my entire life in a war-torn environment. I can hardly remember a time when there was peace in my country. From 1975 to 1990, we experienced the so-called civil war. During that time, I was a university student and I volunteered, volunteered at the Red Cross. One time I had to cross the border between the East and West Beirut to take a sick child to the hospital. Unfortunately, the ambulance driver was shot by a sniper. I suffered terrible injuries and the baby died in my arms. I was stuck at the border for many hours and I promised myself then, and I was maybe 18 years, I promised myself then that I would dedicate my life to serving and fixing the problems in my Lebanon. Life was gloomy and sad, but we learned to adapt to all kinds of situations. I remember when a young man was executed at the front door of our building. I rushed down to check if he was our neighbor on the second floor, but the militia man threatened to shoot me too. They left him on the streets dead for five hours and then sent him to the hospital morgue in a garbage truck. I followed the, I followed the garbage truck to the hospital and stay, started looking for him in the pile of dead people stacked in garbage bags. Note, I was allowed into the hospital and to the morgue because I was a nursing student. Can you imagine what life is like in Lebanon where we are all up till now suffering from a war zone situation? Lebanon, is one of the most beautiful countries in the world, thanks to its diverse and mixed population, as well as its natural beauty, with an area of 10,452 kilometers square. The country has a population of around 4 million Lebanese, and due to the unstable political situation in the region, we also have a large number of refugees in the country, close to 2 million. You know, we have nearly have the number of population of people, we have refugees of this. Lebanese people from all backgrounds are known for their multi-talents and their success sto stories outside the country. Yet inside, you find them fighting over pity issues and killing each other for silly shares. Our president is Christian. And currently we don't have a president also because of these silly issues. As you can see, my personal story transitioned into a discussion about the situation in Lebanon. My initial account of myself transformed, in fact, into a narrative about the community and its circumstances. Our community was once closed off and has become more open-minded and accepting the diverse ideas, beliefs, and cultures of others. Through the difficult experiences I have had, I have learned to appreciate others rather than harboring hatred and resentment. These experiences have taught me to value God's blessings, understand the true meaning of love and peace, and recognize my role as a servant to humanity. I now strive to go above and beyond in tolerating others' prejudices and working to construct bridges of peace. As a mother, I speak to all of you ladies here, with a sense of responsibility and understanding of the gifts that God has given to women, such as care, love, sacrifice, and selflessness for the sake of our children. As mothers, we all share the universal qualities of motherhood. I ask that we all pledge to serve humanity regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, religion, or any other qualities that may divide us. We must acknowledge that we are all God's creation and that he is, for us Muslim, we say that Allah huwa al-adil, he is the just, Allah huwa al-adil.
You know, he is the fair, he is the just. He would not create a blessed community and others to be miserable since he is the just. We are all closer to God's love and blessings when we work together towards improving our lives and the lives of others with love and compassion. No one chooses their family, country, or religion they were raised in. All sacred teachings lead to the same purpose, to teach humans how to live life in a peaceful and orderly way. Let us all join together in this virtual space to work towards this goal for the sake of a peaceful and progressive continuity of a humanity. Thank you very much. Uh, before I close, I would like to uh, really thank Ms. Hermine Schellen, who was the one to introduce me to the Women Federation, for, to the Universal Peace Federation, in fact. And, and uh, you know, she was the one who, who believed in me and sent me in the first place. And I was really amazed when I met Miss Carolyn Hanson, Miss Mitty Tuma, uh, Miss Tina Combs, and, you know, lately Dr. Z uh, Zoe Bennett, you know, thank you very much. I thank you all for your service. And I hope that together we will make a difference to humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Kassem. Thank you for this impressive story, amazing story <laughs> of your you know, life. I haven't been really into, I didn't want to bore, uh, you know, boarding you with, uh, you know, a lot of talking, uh, but, uh, you know, my life now, I am somebody who can travel the world around, despite the fact that, you know, when I married my husband at the beginning, my life was so difficult, so very difficult. Truly, he imprisoned me in a house for a few years, wouldn't let me out of the house because he was jealous that somebody was going to take me away from him. But then I was learning, I was studying, I was raising my kids in that time because I considered that this family is my responsibility and I would not let it go for anything, anything. And then, you know, here I am, I'm a professor. I am, uh, uh, I am somebody who's, you know, I'm a very active politician. I'm a candidate to the parliament for so many times. I was a consultant in Brussels at the, uh, with the women political leaders, you know, international organization, and I'm your friend. So uh, whenever I believe, whenever you, you have the confidence and the trust in yourself, you know, the sky is the limit and there are no obstacles. It's the power within the person. It's never, you know, the things around you, all the challenges. If you believe in yourself, you can cross any, any, obstacle and you can face all the challenges with power and love very true very true thank you very much now we will open the floor to uh, our audience for any questions if you are ready to take some questions if yes, anyone sure. would like Pleasure. to um, ask any questions You know, uh, uh, Dr. Zoe, I, I wanted to add something. You know, if we can see, if we look around us, we see that the world is in a turbulence, you know, and, and material has become is the ultimate purpose of probably human beings and not humanity. I think we as mothers, as I was asking for this pledge, we as mothers from across the world, if we don't really join hands, join efforts, you know, to fight all of this, like, like I feel like it's like a monster trying to eat up humanity for the sake of, of uh, you know, more power and more, more uh, uh, you know, more um, trying to monopolize all over the world, people are dying everywhere. Sickness, uh, wars, it's ridiculous. Mm. It's, it's, I think it's our job 
And you have now this platform, it's all over the world. You have people, you have soldiers. We mothers are soldiers for peace. We have to, to work not only in a peaceful way, we have to work in a smarter way. We have to be really smart in, 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 in uh, um, maneuvering through these crazy uh, plans that are taking place all over the world, you know, for destruction. And I don't understand. There's nobody to do anything to stop the, this, this madness. No, too. You know, no. uh, conferences and meetings, they don't mean anything and they don't stop anything. You know, if I talk about our region in the Middle East, it's really pathetic. You know, and I speak of Lebanon and Syria and, you know, this, uh, the, this, uh, this region the, and Palestine and Israel and uh, all of these countries. It's how can we stop this? What's happening? How can we stop all of this uh, crimes and, and, and uh, you know, all of these wars? There has to be something to be done to stop this madness. Yes, indeed. Yeah. I think Marcia has a question. Certainly. Well, hello, uh, everyone. Hello, Kalul. Thank you for your testimony. And uh, uh, actually, I wanted to tell you that we are honored to have you as our friend in the Women's Federation. Thank you. It's and, my honor, Julie. Uh, well, I don't really have a question, but I, I really agree with you that we have to work together and find ways in which to show the world a different, uh, a different uh, uh, way of doing things. And, uh, and I, I think we are trying uh, on that line. And so I would just uh, promote more cooperation between us, between you, your organization, you as a person and what we are doing, uh, I would uh, emphasize that because uh, your, uh, what you stand for and the way you have fought for the family and also for uh, your right to, to become a, a full human being, as a woman, as a person, uh, well, uh, it's something that we can uh, work together and Certainly. show examples. Yes, I think everyone, each each one of us, faced uh, challenges. You know, mm -hmm. in each, you know, in your word, you faced challenges. Uh, um, you know, my thing is that we should never stop. We should never be scared of facing you know there is always always a light you know in every uh the, you know when we close our eyes so so much you know it's so dark but then you see spots of light there's always this this light that we have to look at and and head towards it there's always a solution. There's nothing in life without a solution, but we have to look for it. And solutions come when, when we work together. Mm -hmm. This is the only way. Individ individuals alone cannot do anything. Yes. We right. have to believe in each other. And, and I am calling for mothers. I really don't care from where you are. You are a mother. You have this motherly passion to take care of your kids. Mothers, I mean every woman, even if you don't have children. You are born to be a mother, you know. You are compassion. You are caring. You are loving. This is in our system. This is how we are built and created. Since we have these qualities, we have to build on them. And these qualities, these are powerful qualities. They're not weak qualities. You know, if you have so much love, it means you have the strongest energy on earth. Love can do anything, you know. 
So with this kind of qualities that we have, we have to think of a way how to put, you know, join these efforts and put pressures on countries to stop the way they are dealing with our lives. Because look at me, I am Lebanese, I'm out of my country, you know, by force, not by choice. I am so grateful I'm living in Dubai now. This is the first time I ever leave Lebanon but because I don't have anybody else. My husband is working here. You know, all of our money was stolen by the government. So we couldn't live, we couldn't survive in the country. We had to come here to survive. You know, we are grateful to, to Dubai and the Emirates because really they are taking care of us. But mm. still, you know, your genes is where your land is. Absolutely. You know, it's the land that calls you. I was born from that soil. You know, it breaks my heart because I'm away. And my boys, I have three boys. Three of them, they don't live in Lebanon. One in, June, in Germany, one in the US, and one here in Dubai. I don't even, I rarely see my boys. I sacrifice all my life to raise them. I understand that they are the children of the world, yeah? And they have to, you know, find their future. But I miss them. Mm, of course. Mm. Yes. Yeah? yeah, and talking about the power of uh, women and power of mothers, I see a question on the chat from uh, Jenny Lambert. Uh, thinking of the women who are, again, totally oppressed in Afghanistan, how can we impact their situation? And then she continues, do women in Lebanon have equal rights and free now to choose their life path? So these are two questions, one for- I, I will talk about uh, Lebanon uh, first. Yes, uh, life has changed. Uh, I was, uh, at the beginning I started that uh, uh, you cannot, talk about my story as a story of a typical Lebanese woman because uh, in Lebanon we have 18 religions yeah 18 religions each religion have their own norms and values and cultures they're totally different so a Muslim Sunnite like myself uh, uh, my life was different from my friends who were Christians you know, and they, they belong to their uh, way of life, different values. Uh, their girls were, were, they had more freedom, more space in their life to choose the university to go out. I did not have that choice. And also the Muslims in Lebanon, also, you know, not all of them. Inside the religion, there are different sects. And inside the sects, they, they live differently. So the people in Lebanon, uh, it's unlike also the Gulf area or other countries in, in the Arab world. Arab world is more conservative than the Lebanese people. I was the person who was living in a total patriarch community with a very conservative people. But believe me, I was the one to change the way my brothers, my family look at life when I forced my way out to the university, you know, I taught them, I was the one to go to the university. All of them, they went out merchants and they studied, they lived out abroad, worked out abroad. But, uh, you know, I was the one to get to higher education. And now I'm working on my PhD on Arab women leadership. And I will get it hopefully by the end of this year. I am somebody who pursue knowledge and education and service until the last breath of my life. So this is uh, for, uh, so uh, as I told you, yes, Lebanese women are more liberal. Uh, they are liberal than, than probably the women in the region. Yeah, and as for the, as for the Afghani woman, please, uh, uh, can you read the question again? Yes. Uh, 
thinking of the women who are again totally who are, who, uh, who are again totally oppressed in Afghanistan how can we impact their situation well uh, as I told you we have to work together and and uh, we have to think of you know not only uh, working together we have to think how to maneuver in a political way to put pressure on on uh, on uh, governments to change policies, you know? It, it takes really uh, maximum work. It takes maximum intense work uh, as how to find ways uh, to change policies in countries. It's not easy, but we can do it. Of course we can do it. Mm. I mean, yes. Just wondering uh, why you wanted to um, go into politics, especially you're applying in the Brussels Parliament, uh, the U European Parliament. Could you yeah, share? So uh, I, I started my uh, NGO in 2008. And uh, as I said that in 2000, in the year 2000, I started my service, you know, and I was introduced to the community by the late prime minister. So I started uh, uh, going, supporting NGOs, you know. I belong to a well-off family. So I was going uh, across all of Lebanon and, you know, learning about NGOs, how do they function, and supporting the ones that are really functional because there are so many NGOs yet that you put question mark on them. So I was investigating doing this uh, police work myself. And then uh, in the year 2008, I started my own NGO called, and I named it Mothers from Lebanon. The objective behind this NGO is to solve the problem. It's a terrible problem in Lebanon. Three children, beggars all over the streets, you know, sometimes children in, in diapers with, the, with, the, with their milk in their hand and they are begging for money with their mother. So I wanted to solve that, uh, that problem. And then I was followed by the mobs and they threatened to kill me because I was investigating because it turned out it was, there is a big politician around, you know, responsible for this uh, thing. In 2013, can you imagine, let me tell you this story. In Lebanon, you know, there is the government hospitals. Each religion has a quota for patients. So if the, uh, if the quota for the Muslim Sunnite was saturated, any other patient who wants to be admitted to the hospital will not be allowed because they would tell him that therefore this month, this patient was, uh, you know, uh, that Muslims are not allowed into the hospital. So there was this uh, sick person who said that he wanted me to help him to, be, to go to the hospital. And his operation was uh, costed $20,000. I didn't have that kind of money. So then uh, uh, there was this message. Obama then was the president of the US and he was on TV and he said, yes, you can. You know, this really, this message just triggered so many, empowered me so much. And I was like, I can run for the parliament. I mean, I have my master's in political science and I have, you know, my diploma as, a, uh, as an international consultant. Uh, why not? I can run for the parliament. So I ran for the parliament. You know, there was uh, this elections uh, and there was a meeting for this woman. In let me tell you also, this. <laughs> there was a meeting for this woman in... Uh, uh, in Lebanon, who were running as candidates for the parliament. There was a minister, I don't know from which country, European country, he said that if you are not part, if you don't belong to a party in the country, you cannot run for the parliament. And I am independent. I run independent. I'm against all parties in the country because all parties in Lebanon are religious and conflicting parties. They, you know, work against, they kill each other. So I told you, whom do you think you are? To, you are a stranger from my country and telling me 
that I am not going to be a parliamentarian. I want you to memorize my face. My name is Khulud Wattar Qasim. And believe me, I will bring change to Lebanon. And I was, you know, so very passionate about the issue. So there was a meeting in Jordan for parla women parliamentarians. And he suggested my name, that I have to attend that meeting. In that meeting, you know, I was outspoken and I was there. So also they invited me to go to Brussels for a meeting of the women in parliament. It was the first time. I went there. I went there as, as, as a guest. Every country had to say something, you know, about their country. I saw the woman parliamentarian who was sitting inside the European parliament and there for that meeting. And she was Lebanese. And I didn't see the flag of Lebanon on the screen because every country that was going to say the word, they had to put the flag up. So I went to her and I told her, hello, her name was Mrs. Wen. How are you? My name is Khulud Watar, I'm Lebanese too. I don't see the flag of Lebanon on the screen. She said, I don't feel like talking. I told her, excuse me, you don't represent yourself. You represent my country. And I need to see the flag of Lebanon up on the screen. And she said, well, you can talk. I was like, how can I talk? I mean, I don't have an official representation from the country. And she said, I will give you my, this paper. I still have the paper. So I said, okay, I'm going to talk. So I raised my hand and then they said, sorry, Khulud, you're not a parliamentarian. I told them I have an official paper saying that I can talk. He said, yes. I said, thank you very much for this meeting. I need to see the flag of my country up. They put the flag of Lebanon. And then, you know, the, uh, the head of the organization, her name is Silvana Koshmeheren. She was really fascinated by, you know, my passion. And she spoke with me. And then she said, do you want to be our consultant in the Middle East and North Africa, represented, you know, representing us? And this is, this is how things, you know, when you believe in your, yourself, doors open up for you. You have to be passionate and you don't see the obstacles. You don't look at them. I mean, I'm not saying that you have to be, you know, uh, unconsiderate and not planning. No, you have to see uh, 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 the obstacles, but don't consider them as a threat for you. Just look at them and say that, yes, yes, I can. Yes, I can cross them all. Yes, I can do. Yes, we can bring peace to the world. Yes, if we work together properly. If we don't see any discrimination between each other. Yes, we can. And yes, us mothers will bring that peace to the world. Yes, very good. I think we need to applaud that. <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful. Yeah, I'm going you. to continue with some more questions that have come to the chat. Eddie right. Iverson says, what do you think about the current situation of women in Iran? And then she has another question about your husband. First, you asked to address that about Iran, and then I will. Okay, as I told you, it's the same thing with the women of Afghanistan. It's the same thing. It's an oppressed country. It's putting pressure on the whole people. It's not only the women on on people at large so if what is it in our hand we are not governments we are mothers we are we can be stronger than governments if we know how to work together you know to help other women in the world yeah indeed indeed yes and now um she's also asking how do you did you change your husband to allow you to have the freedom to do what you are doing? Has he changed over the years? I yes, think of course. you explained something. Before. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, that at the beginning he put me in the house and really he locked me in. I was I was so frustrated, so angry, because you know, since I was born, I always felt that I'm a dream, you know, free spirit. So my father also locked me in the house. And then I got that husband who also, you know, as if inherited the same thing from my father. But I was so overwhelmed 
with my boys, you know, I really fell in love. I was looking at them. What kind of a gift God has given me? So amazing to have children. And I love their mischief. I love their, their craziness. You know, I was going crazy with them in the house. Um, I told you I am a patient person. I look at my objective far away and I start working slowly to build my case, to reach my goal with time. So in the meantime, I was locked in, yes, but I was taking care of my boys, really giving them the world from my eyes. And at the same time, I was studying, you know, I was studying, reading, getting any kind of book I can get my hand off and read. I was reading, studying, and taking care of my boys. With time, in the year 2000, when I had a dream, and I was so fierce. At the beginning, when every time my husband would say that you don't do this, don't do that, I was so submissive. I would say, okay, all right, I will do that. I'm not going, you know, I'm going to listen to all your orders. When I had that dream, you know, my pride was so angry. Like he's bringing a woman and he wants me to be her servant. It was a dream. Really, this dream totally changed my life. I became so powerful that he didn't dare to stop me. He couldn't. And the first thing I did is that I went to the house of the prime minister, prime minister Rafiq Hariri in the year 2000. And I told him, I went, to the, I didn't take an appointment. I just went there. I asked the doorman. I told him, is the prime minister upstairs? He said, yes. I told him, tell him Khulud Qasim wants to meet you. He said, does he know you? I said, yes. I mean, it was a lie I did. I'm sorry, but I really lied. So when he opened the door, God had mercy on his soul. He opened the door and he said, do I know you? I told him, no, but it was the only way I can see you. I didn't want, nobody was going to give me any appointment. He said, yes, how can I help you? I told him, I'm going to help you with the economical situation in the country. He was, oh my God, really? How is that? <laughs> it was so simple and spontaneous that he really believed me. So I told him, I want to have this event in, uh, in, uh, at the Phoenicia Hotel. It's a fundraising event. I'm taking all the merchandise from the people, uh, from the shops, and I will sell them for a price. And the difference, I'm going to, you know, give them for uh, NGOs, the, the, uh, the income that we make. So he was happy. So he, su he supported me. The thing is that my husband, when he saw that I, you know, people were talking about me, he felt proud and he trusted my judgment. So whatever I say then, he started trusting my judgment because he considered me, I became the backbone of the house. I became the person, you know, to, to take charges, take all the initiative in the house. And he trusted up till now, he still trusts my judgment because even if I fail in one thing, I would never let him know, let anybody know. I will try to fix my failure to make it a win. Mm. That's how he changed with time. He totally changed. Up till now, he'd say, I'm not the same person I was before I met you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's actually what we are meant to do, isn't it? We yeah, of come course. together with our husband and uh, uh, we are meant to improve each other. Of and course, as yeah. wives and mothers, we that's, have. That's why it's a it's a partnership. It's not yes. at the beginning. He felt that he owned me. You know, he owned my 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 way of thinking, my way of behaving, the way I look. You know, the way I talk, everything. I made him feel ashamed of this way of thinking. And he doesn't. He's not like that at all now. Yeah. Great. This is great. This is very good. Okay. Um, is there any more questions? We already are approaching the end of our um, meeting. 
but uh, feel free to ask any questions, to give any comments. Uh, personally, I really would like to 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 comment that it's uh, absolutely the way to um, make to have a meaningful life, to have the op the optimism and the dream to realize something for the whole, for the others, to serve. Yeah, and you know, to serve not really um, just for for our own satisfaction, but really to serve for the benefit of the people around us. If we yeah. if we have all the, always the desire to uh, uh, make people uh, happy and comfortable around us, this is a great thing. This is really very important. We can also be very happy and comfortable. Don't you think so? Of course, of course. Totally, I totally agree. You know, um, uh, Dr. Zoe, I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm really blessed with something. My heart is full of love. Mm -hmm. I love everything. I love everything, literally. Uh, and, and this love makes me uh, try to understand and translate human behavior. You know, understand why would the person behave in this way? And then whenever I understand the way, why would they behave in this way? I will find a way to get through that person and try to communicate with them. You know, and it's always a success story. It's always a success story with me. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much for inspiring us so much today. Um, there is a Mrs. Manar Farahat who says, so proud of you, Kulud. Love <laughs> is the key. Indeed. It is always the key. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you if anyone doesn't have any other um, comment? Or what, is, what is your zodiac sign? She's asking, Manal Farahat. Well, I am a Libra. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you think this plays some role? <laughs> Libra, Libra is the boss. Libra is the, the it best. It is. Yeah, the best oh, woman, I see. Okay. The Sorry, best woman I'm to be a boss is the Libra see. woman. Really? <laughs> Yes, so um, we are so proud of you. I Thank am you. from Egypt, and uh, uh -huh. uh, but I, I mean I live in uh, UK. But uh, when I saw you, I felt oh, great energy just covering everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you very much, Ms. Manal. You're so beautiful in and out. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much for Thank you so, so much. Grateful to meet you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And yeah, I would I'm, really, really yeah. again repeat my thanks to the Women Federation for their service. You know, this platform is, is amazing and massive. You know, you spread all over the world. This is what you're doing is amazing. You are the light that we see in this time. The time is so gloomy across the world. Mm -hmm. You have this, this, this energy of light that if you, if you, I mean, I, I'm sure you work in a, in a beautiful way, but also I think we have to spread our ties across to make it so stronger so that we can come to, we can come to some conclusion and some solutions to this madness in the world. It breaks my heart when I see the people in Ukraine, you know, dying in this vicious way. It breaks my heart at the same time to see the people also in Palestine, we cannot find the solution. We have to find a solution for what's happening. It breaks my heart what's happening in Syria, in Lebanon, in many other countries in the world that there are, there are you know, between the two Koreas, when is it going to end? In Afghanistan, in Iran, in, you know, the world is crazy. Let's yeah. put a bigger platform for mothers. Mothers are the secret that are going to save the world. Indeed. You know, the land is the mother. I think someone it's else has an, uh, something to say. Hi there. Yeah. Hope. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much for all this story. What we could hear, it's amazing. 
and especially like because you're a Muslim woman, you speak about God in such a way which is really unique for what we all feel when we close our eyes that we are all one. And uh, the solution is really in this that we together, all the different religious people, that we have to embrace each one as brothers and sisters. And uh, I'm sure you know about the Mother of Peace, who is really inspiring us, who uh, is a initiator of the Women's Federation for World Peace and that we really can have so much hope in working together. And thank you very much for all your efforts, for all the ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you know, I spread this thank to all of you women, really, ladies across the world, because, you know, you are opening up the space for us and for you and for humanity. So. Thank you. And thank you very much. I think this is a wonderful conclusion yeah. we can have here. Uh, I want to remind you that this is a monthly event and uh, we have a great uh, surprise. Uh, I'm sure we will have a very another very inspiring woman that is going to talk to us in February. Uh, we will definitely let you know uh, yeah. thank through you. the networks that you receive the news for this um event you will receive more yeah thank you very much thank, thank you me. more than anyone to uh mrs kasem to Clute that uh who came and uh, really shared so openly I appreciate for the opportunity i appreciate the opportunity i mean you don't have to thank me dr zoe you have um i i am grateful for for making my voice be heard for making my heart be seen for making my feelings be spread ever, everywhere, you know. I thank you for giving me this, opening up this platform for me. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I think we can end here. Thanking everyone for coming and thanking everyone for taking this time to, uh, to, to listen and to participate. Uh, we really hope to see you next month as well. Thank Ooh, you. There is a bit, very big chat there. <laughs> um, if we finish, we will lose it, but I'm sure we will copy it afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Okay. Then. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Holut. You're awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Hermina. <laughs> I missed you, my love. I miss you. <laughs> miss Thank you too. You, yeah, you were the one to bring me into this platform. So thank you, Irmina. Thank an awesome you. friend from an awesome person, right? Yeah, yeah. She awesome is awesome goes to them. I just love her so much. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.